this is a direct appeal to Victoria Mary Clark. I'm asking if you would please consider backing my song, We Tried, written about the climate crisis and what will happen if we don't act for Christmas number one this year, instead of your husband Shane McGowan's song, Fairy Tale in New York. I don't know how to film this, so please forgive me. I might look at these pieces of paper to remind me of the things that I wanted to say to you. And it's difficult because you're not actually here. I've never actually met you. I've read an, like a beautiful article um, on the on the Guardian, um, like about how you're doing right now and about the story between you and Shane. And I'm sorry if this upsets you and if I get this wrong in the way that I say it. Um, some people have told me not to do this video because it's insensitive and it's crass and it's inappropriate and entitled or it could come across that way and I would I would never dream of asking you this in any other circumstances but we're in a life threatening and emer life threatening emergency and that is why I'm asking you this so firstly I just want to say I genuinely I'm so sorry for your loss as a fellow songwriter myself, like Shane was an amazingly talented songwriter and this might sound like I'm sucking up to you, but like genuinely Fairy Tale in New York, I think is objectively the best Christmas song. Maybe I'm a bit biased, like I'm half Irish. My dad is from Tralee in Kerry. Um, I don't know if you've <laughs> been to the Rosa Tralee Festival. That's uh, it's quite weird <laughs> to be honest, but quite a laugh. Um, but I'm so sorry for your loss and I mean I just read that article in the Guardian which actually sounds like you're you're doing okay <laughs> and like it really warmed my heart because I'm spiritual as well um and it was just lovely to hear the way you spoke about communicating with Shane even though he's no longer in this physical realm um so I'm really glad to hear that but I can also imagine that you know maybe you're not as um I guess good all the time and maybe you're overcome with extreme grief sometimes, heartbreak, devastation and although I'm not in your situation and I don't know how you're feeling, I recognise those feelings and I recognise them in relation to the climate crisis which brings me to my song and who I am. So <laughs> I'm Louise, I'm 25, I'm a singer-songwriter, um, I'm from Hertfordshire in England and um, I'm a climate activist, um, so I wrote this song, We Tried, about the climate crisis and what will happen if we don't act, and I can't really explain the message of it by speaking about it, even if you just heard it, it doesn't really explain the message, you kind of have to watch the music video, um, because it shows, it paints very vividly the picture there of what is already being lost by people all around the world, and I guess it's an expression of my own grief at what could be lost, um, and what already is. <sighs> I mean, I wrote a statistic here, but <laughs> you know, every 28 seconds, one loved one, one person's loved one dies in East Africa due to famine, which is due to crop failure, due to drought, due to the climate crisis. But I feel like statistics aren't what this is about, like, You've just lost your husband, what, nearly three weeks ago now. Um, that's a personal story to you, you know? You feel something about that. So I thought the best way for me to, I guess, pitch <laughs> you supporting my song is to share my personal story and to share the stories of people that I know and love who have been impacted by this crisis. Because, I guess, grief you're in a state of grief now and grief is the most relevant feeling to the climate crisis and, and how I feel towards it and how many people do. So I want to I wanna tell this in a series of stories so I hope you have, I don't know, just a bit of time to hear them. So I don't have a photo of my friend Fuseni. He wanted to remain, remain anonymous due to his own safety Fuseni is an activist and a climate refugee from Mali in West Africa. And I wanted just to read some of his words. This is his story of grief and of death. I saw with my own eyes several members of my family dying of hunger and thirst 
aunts, grandparents, brothers and sisters, as well as other people from our village, due to floods and droughts. We spent months and months eating tree leaves. Some people ate animal skins as well as sludge. Among the victims, there were people of all ages, pregnant women, babies, the elderly, and so on. I left my country of origin, Mali, given the inter-ethnic conflicts and terrorism to which I also lost several members of my family. Because it hadn't rained for several years, men are no longer able to grow crops to feed their families. So no wonder why some have become terrorists and others have joined criminal armed groups. They do it for money to feed their family. My activism also caused me a lot of problems in Mali because I campaigned against violence against women and children, as well as forced and early marriage of young girls and for LGBT rights. Suddenly my life was in danger, so I applied for a visa to participate in COP26 in Glasgow as a climate activist. Once I arrived in the UK, I applied for asylum with the British authorities because I could no longer return to my country. I came to the UK in the hope of having a better life in order to help my family in Africa and continue my fights for climate and environmental social justice. My experience here is divided between joy and sadness. I am very happy to be here because I'm safe, since I have escaped death several times. Unfortunately, I am in a miserable situation of isolation and I suffer from chronic loneliness. I'm still waiting for the result of my asylum application so I can lead a normal life and build my future. It has been almost two years since I've been here in the UK. I have not received a work permit nor a residence permit, which prevents me from working to support myself and help my family. I am alone, without a friend or companion, and without a job. That's my friend, Fuseni. Sorry, my neck hurts. This is my friend, Juan Pablo Guterres. He's alive. But paramilitary groups in Colombia tried to kill him twice for defending indigenous people's rights and lands, which multinational fossil fuel companies Drummond and Glencore were destroying in order to extract coal. They shot his car 16 times. So he was forced to leave his country, Colombia, with his seven-year-old daughter. He now lives in Europe. But he continues to receive death threats from the Colombian paramilitary, even though he's here. And his aunt was also nearly murdered. The paramilitary groups came to her house looking to kill her because she had been speaking out in European countries about what was happening in Colombia. His cousin was murdered. That attempt was successful. That was Juan Pablo Guterres. This is a photo of my friend Zavi. He was 22 when he decided he couldn't take this world anymore. They say he took his life, I say it was taken. He was a climate activist like me. And here is an extract from a poem that his partner wrote following his death. A question from the lady over there. Mrs. Coroner, Xavier died with a tag around his ankle. Wasn't he under the duty of care of the system? Wasn't he partly in prison, imprisoned? Not at all. A tag is just a little restriction. Nothing like being in prison. He was a free man with a fancy ankle bracelet. Then prison. Let's talk about prison. Where he was sent without a trial for the danger his immense heart was posing to humankind. Dropped there, locked up in a box, no air to breathe, with young troubled men to go insane. They call it justice. He cut himself in prison, a fact you mentioned, still had scars all over his left arm, and nobody looked after him. Nobody. That was a long time before his death. The causality is too loose. You can move a complaint with the prison system, if you wish. 
It's beyond the remit of my work. I establish the facts. I don't connect the dots. And God forbid anybody learns anything from a dead young man. Young lady over there. But he was fighting for all of us. Animals, plants, and all of humanity. And he was incarcerated. And he was scared to be incarcerated again and again when nobody heard his cry. <sighs> this is far beyond my reach. I need you to stop talking now, young lady. This is getting political. I'm here to assert the facts. Zamia died by suspension in Sidmouth Woods. Sober. Healthy. He took his own decision. Uh, I'm very sorry for all of your pain. The inquiry is over. You know, one of the last things that he said to me, it was like after a few days where I hadn't messaged him and he was so worried about me. I had loads of missed calls from him and he was like so relieved that I was alive when I when I replied. I was like, oh, wow, he was really, really worried about me. And I just think that was a sign that I missed. You know, if he was to assume that I was suicidal, he probably was himself. That was Zavi. The final story that I'm telling that isn't my own. I don't have a photo for this story. I don't have a photo for this life that has once again been taken by the climate crisis. Because this person was never born, this person was a baby, my friend thinks he was a boy. <sighs> My friend fell accidentally pregnant. And she'd always wanted a child. That was one of her dreams. <laughs> and she had an abortion. Because she couldn't bear to bring a baby into a world where there may not be enough food and water for it in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years, whatever, whenever it fucking hits. She couldn't bear to bring her baby into a world that might be ridden with war and conflict over scarce resources because of mass migration. I'll give you one statistic. By 2030, we are predicted to have up to 1 billion climate refugees, people forced from their homes because it's too hot to live there. That's one in eight people alive right now being made into climate refugees in just over six years away. <laughs> My friend wanted me to make clear that she wanted to kill herself because of that decision. She was so traumatised by it, it completely destroyed her. But some say she chose, she chose to do that, that was her choice. I'm pro-choice. I wouldn't consider that choice. <sighs> and finally, my story. <laughs> This is my family, these are my parents. This is my dad who's Irish and my mum who's Polish. They met in London, outside a pub. <laughs> and this is my brother and me. Obviously not from the present, from the past. Um, that, they're my family and <laughs> I feel like I've cried all the tears now, but I love them so much that is why i do what i do i'm fighting for them they don't deserve to suffer they don't deserve societal collapse nobody does so i don't want to lose them to a crisis that is so fucking avoidable that it actually breaks my fucking heart a crisis created by a few handfuls of people in power who 
you know, whether they're psychopaths, narcissists, I don't know, but I've concluded they must not know what love is. If they did, why on earth would they be acting this way? Why on earth would Rishi Sunak be licensing over a hundred new oil and gas licenses? Why on earth would any of the world leaders be ignoring the cries of the United Nations, of the International Energy Agency, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? 99.9% .9 of leading climate scientists are all saying we're heading towards hell on earth. And we can't have any new fossil fuel projects and developments. And they're ignoring that to make money. But you wouldn't do that if you knew what love is. And because they don't know what love is, they don't know how grief feels. So I don't think they're really plagued by this crisis. The bottom line is, I don't want you to go through any more grief than you already have. I know that you don't have children, but this crisis doesn't just affect children and grandchildren, it affects the elderly. You know, one woman, one grandmother in the UK this year, she was found by her son drowned in her own living room because of flood water. You know, the elderly are one of the most vulnerable. I'm, sca I'm scared to lose my parents because we don't know how soon society is going to collapse. So if you have, I don't know, brothers or sisters, cousins, nieces or nephews, friends, just people you love, they are affected by this crisis. If not currently, then they will be unless, unless change happens. And there is still time for change to happen. <sighs> Which is why I'm asking you this. I don't want anyone to go through more grief. Your husband's death it's tragic, it's awful, and I'm so sorry it happened. I'm sorry if it doesn't seem genuine, but of course I'm sorry that it happened. It completely makes sense that you would want to honour him and his memory by getting Fairy Tale in New York to Christmas number one this year. It completely makes sense you want people to remember him. But as I said earlier, every 28 seconds, somebody's loved one dies because of this crisis. An avoidable death. BBC introducing, chose not to play my song, We Tried. I submit it to them and I never heard back. But they played the one that I wrote about dating boys. Is it because it's about the climate? The Metropolitan Police banned me from the whole of London from my own gigs and interviews and open mics from my own career for three months. I'll see what my solicitor says tomorrow, maybe. But until the 22nd of February, uh, currently, I'm not allowed in, into London at all. They banned me because I sang my song, We Tried, outside Rishi Sunak's house. I don't know if you saw it, but I was arrested for singing a song. That song, my song, We Tried, about the climate crisis and what will happen if he doesn't act outside his house harassment whilst he gets away with murdering, mass murdering the whole of humanity. So they've banned me. Is that because it's climate protest? If this song, if my song doesn't get to Christmas number one, it will be forgotten about. The media will choose not to report on it in the same way they choose not to report on the climate crisis. Even if it was number two, they could actually get away, probably, with sweeping it under the rug. Stuart Lee actually told me that, well, he tells me he did have a Christmas number one with Coming Over Here, but it wasn't actually Christmas number one because it was political, it was basically anti-racist, it was about immigration, and the media, they didn't like it, they, <laughs> it didn't suit their agenda, so they didn't report on it, and it pushed it down the charts. So even if my song was number two, or whatever, they could get away with sweeping the climate crisis and all the stories that I've just told you under the rug. But if it was number one, they would be forced to report on it, right? You can't just not say what the Christmas number one was, right? So they'd be forced to report on the story, on my story, 
on my friend's stories, on our story. I want you to know that you're not alone in your grief. Some grief is unavoidable. I don't know if yours was. I don't know the ins and outs of Shane's health condition and situation. It's still obviously awful and hard that he died. But I know that some grief for sure is avoidable. So shouldn't we do all we can to avoid it? So I'm asking you, with nothing but love in my heart for you and for everybody alive right now, I'm asking you to please call. Call to your fans, your followers. Call to the media, the press. Tell them that you want, we tried, a song about the climate crisis to be Christmas number one this year. All proceeds go to climate causes. The link to the music video is in my bio in the DistroKid link, in case you want to have like a proper watch and see what the whole message is about. Um, it's a lot, it's moving a, a lot of people already um, emotionally and yeah, hopefully into collective climate action, which I believe is the only solution that we have left. And of course we're running out of time. So that's why I'm asking you this, but I don't expect anything from you. I don't know you, you don't know me, you know, um, and in general, I've learned not to expect things from people, um, not in like a weird way, just in like, you know, I'm grateful for what I have. And yeah, I hope you're okay. I hope, well, I can understand if this video upset you, I feel like, <laughs> It's natural because it's an emotional topic and obviously what's happened in your life recently, you may be more emotional, uh, understandably, than normal. But I think emotions are our power. That's where our humanity is. But anyway, I'm just rambling now. The last thing I wrote was, I wish you all the best and I'm sending you nothing but love. Thank you. So thank you so much, Victoria. And genuinely, I'm sending you nothing but love. Louise.